Rising podcast with Bettina Brown. This is the platform I've chosen to talk about living a life that's in fulfillment and alignment with your hopes, your dreams, and your vision. Walking away from things that don't move the needle towards your own North Compass. And if that sounds like something that you're interested in, you are really going to like my conversation with Sam Thiara phenomenal human being. You can just tell his brain is thinking on deeper levels, but he has so much to offer. And I invite you to listen.
I am very happy to have you today, Sam. Um, you know, you you wrote this quote or you say it is your line. And right then and there, you had me. It was, everyone's life is an autobiography. Make yours worth reading. Mm -hmm. Now, for a line like that, we've had to have some life. Can you share a little bit how you got to where you are? Of course. And the quote is something I live by. It's something I've embodied in everything I do because it made me realize that everybody, including myself, is building an autobiography, chapter by chapter, page by page. And many times people don't feel that their story is significant or worth reading. And I'm like, no, no, your story is worth sharing. Every single person's story is worth sharing. And that has really become the essence of what I do in my life, which is talk to people. It's been about 5,000 conversations to date just to sort of engage people to share with me who they are as opposed to what they do. And that has guided me in life with regards to being, you know, either misunderstood or not knowing the pathway and journey to where I am today. And the simplest way that I can describe it is the moment that I stopped focusing on what I was doing and turn my attention to who I am, which relates to that quote, clarity emerged and everything suddenly shifted and changed and my narrative changed as a result of it. And I can go into more if you'd like. Yeah, because when you said who people are as opposed to what they do, mm -hmm. um, right then, like when we introduce ourselves, we introduce by our profession, our role, mother, father, family do you feel in those converse 5000 conversations that people struggle to disassociate who they are from what they do oh totally and even in my class classes that i teach at university one of the first things i do is i make them write a personal statement and a personal statement is an introduction if you and i met for the first time how would you introduce yourself sam is an individual who and then we revisit it at the end of the semester. But in all of these conversations, we try to shift a narrative to focus on who they are as opposed to what they do. And it, and it can be awkward at times because I think that this is how we define ourselves is by what. And, you know, if I had to introduce myself to you, here's how I would introduce myself. Sam is an individual who is guided by five things in his life and career. And the five things are servant leadership, story sharing, activator igniter, champion enabler, community do-gooder. Those five things have enabled me to help individuals, teams, organizations, educational institutions, and nonprofits to their pinnacle best. But it's also enabled me to be a speaker and a storyteller, and a mentor and a coach, a writer and a blogger, a problem solver, educator, as well as a community activator. That's a statement that just says who I am. Now from there, you could pull the essence of, these are things he can do, but I've ultimately just shared who I am. It really shows that an individual who has spent the time and reflected on who they are, and it's, it, it's made clarity where now I don't take on projects or initiatives unless it hits those five things I shared at the beginning. Yeah. And that's a, it's almost uh, like you're practicing that that personal statement is your mission statement. Mm -hmm. And so that you, whatever comes up in life, relationship, activity, that the yes goes towards a mission statement and the no go for things that aren't in mm -hmm. alignment with that. Yeah. And, and the important part is because you make that into your life or mission statement, opportunities emerge because there's other people have clarity on what you're able to do. I mean, one of the things I share is think of it as, you know, there's a corner store and Starbucks. And, you know, you had to go buy a pair of flip-flops today. Would you go to Starbucks to buy a pair of flip-flops? Of course not. Because we know tea, coffee, and food-related items. Corner store, maybe, because you know what? They sell food, lottery tickets, fried chicken, coffee, hardware. And, you know, so you might go in there. And people may argue, but isn't it better to be the corner store because you offer so many different things? But here's the thing. People want to go to the place where they know that they can, you know, they don't want to fish around. They want to just go to where they know that this person knows what they're doing or is capable in that regard. So you want to try to become that brand. And the articulation of that brand is so important because it now suddenly focuses on 
who you are and what you're capable of doing. And with that too, do you feel that when you're, when you're having these conversations with people, mm-hmm. that storytelling, that's really how we connect with people. Do you feel mm-hmm. that we've lost some of our storytelling ability? Absolutely. It's because again, we are usually going quite short with regards to our responses or, and you don't want a story to be extremely long winded either. You want something that there's a purpose behind sharing a story and a reason behind it. Uh, And I mean, that's what my first TEDx speech was, is discovering the extraordinary in the ordinary. We live in a world that we deem as ordinary, but embedded in the ordinary are these tremendously extraordinary experiences. And they're not these epic things in life. These are small things, but they're extraordinary. And the way that I capture the essence of this in my TEDx speech was through a concept I came up with that I call carpe, as in carpe diem. Carpe is embodying five things, which is curiosity, appreciation, reflection, perspectives, experience. I go through life with a very curious nature. So things stop me. So curiosity is important because that's the that's where you travel through life with your radar on. Appreciation is when you stop, it's either a person, a situation, or a thing. You embrace it and appreciate it for more than what it is. Reflection is where you start adding purpose and meaning to it, why this is important to me. And the perspectives, because we all have our own perspectives, we add richness to it because of our perspectives. And the final thing is that experience. If you don't capture your story as an experience, your story will die an untimely death because it's never to be remembered. It's never to be told. So you go through this process. So that's an example of how you discover the extraordinary in the ordinary, but that also becomes a story now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, you know, Brene Brown talks a lot about storytelling, that that is how we connect Mm -hmm. with people, not in short tweets, not in short posts. Um, And that's why the dinner conversation Mm -hmm. or a lunchtime where you're sitting is so important with that. You Mm -hmm. also, I watched that TED talk. Um, You also talked about, um, your footprint story mm-hmm. and the difference between a footprint in the sand today versus legacy. Would you expand on that? Like where your thoughts went and how sure. that's taking you forward? Yeah, because again, we go to a beach and, you know, for me, it was more like I saw some footprints and I, I plopped myself down instead of just crossing them and going to the water. <clears throat> instead of focusing on what I guess everyone else was, I focused on something else, which was looking at these footprints. And I wanted to know who do they belong to? What's their story? What's their journey? Where are they coming from? Where are they going? What are their trials and tribulations? What's their joys and happiness in life? But the realization is these footprints are gone once the tide comes in. How do you leave a lasting impression and not just a footprint? And that's where this whole aspect, as you mentioned, about the storytelling becomes our personal narrative, our legacy piece. And the importance of how we need to capture and share these stories. And I mean, that's where, you know, those memorable pieces come forward. And it's interesting because uh, one of the five elements I shared was story sharing, not storytelling. And the reason is storytelling is unilateral, one directional, I'm going to tell, this is what I do in my class is I share, I tell stories. But story sharing goes back to what you said about the art of the conversation. Because in a conversation, we story share, everybody has something to contribute, I'll tell a story, or you'll tell a story. And based on what you said, I'm going to layer in another story of an experience. And then you're like, yeah, but you're, I got to tell you about this, this happened to me. And you know, all of those things. And I like to focus it on story sharing, which is the art of conversation. And I totally agree with what you were saying and about what Brene Brown said is we've lost that art of communication, that art of conversation, because our phones or devices, which connects us to some extent, but it's a very transactional connection as opposed to something that's more transformational. Yes. 
Yeah. And transaction is a key word because then we look to relationships or how we relate as a mm -hmm. transaction. Mm -hmm. And um, even if the transaction creates some of something of value monetarily, it does take, it does take yeah. away um, often, not always. Yeah. You also talked about doing something to leave that lasting impression. And you had, you had different things, vision of our future choices, limitations, and persistence. Mm -hmm. And I'd like you to share your thoughts on persistence, um, mm -hmm. because I feel from my little experience here um, that persistence is something I'm not seeing as much of as I thought I once did, maybe growing mm -hmm. up, or maybe I'm out of tune, but I don't feel like that's yeah. there often. <laughs> no, I, persistence, I think, is this, it's, we're in it for the marathon. We're not there as a hundred meter dash. And about realizing that you know, anything that we embrace or undertake, you know, it goes back to another quote that I've always lived by obstacles are the necessary bricks on a road to success. And what that means is, you know, something may not work right or not work out and people just walk away from it. For me, persistence means, okay, that didn't work out. It's a setback. What do I learn and how do I move forward from this as opposed to just walking away? And persistence is this idea that anything that you want in life, it's there, it's, it's going to happen, and you're on a crash course if it's important to you. But when you throw a limitation up, you've now said goodbye to your persistence or that, that goal that you really want to achieve. So persistence is about building this resilience in to say, okay, if I, if I can't do it this way, can I do it another way? Or... Do I need to pull other people in to support me, to help me get where I need to go? I'm one of those individuals. I thrive in ambiguity and uncertainty. I mean, that's the space where magic happens. And it's interesting because that's the part people fear. And they stay away from that. Many people will stay away from it because, I don't know, they feel like they're going to get burned or they feel like, you know, it's an absolute piece. Either it works or it doesn't work. And probably it's not going to work. So they're not walking down that pathway. And I'm not saying to do dangerous things. And uh, it's, it's all about this whole aspect of thriving in the uncertainty and ambiguity. You have the tools within you to solve these problems. Just persistence is going to help you get there. Mm -hmm. from, your, from your plentiful conversations that had the intent difference, mm -hmm. right? They weren't just little side conversations mm -hmm. that you you it's obvious that you think with intention that mm -hmm. you act with intention do you feel that some people are just born mm -hmm. with the ability to have this persistence regardless of fear and others are born differently or is this because of life experience what mm -hmm. share share your own yeah. um experiences please yeah i mean i think that we have persistence within us and to some extent i think it depending on circumstances that surrounds us or situations that emerge you know the fight or flight piece it's also what i call the noise that's around us the noise can be deafening at times where if you aren't fully comfortable with who you are as an individual the noise will maybe steer you away from that persistence and or you know guide you in a different direction that really isn't authentic to you so i think the environment plays a, a huge part of it i think that you know we come wired with some level of persistence i think some people obviously have more of it than others but equally based on the environment and the uh you know the upbringing and you know were you in an encouraging environment or you know uh, an environment that said, okay, that didn't work out. Well, maybe let's sit down and try to see how we can solve this and uh, work on it. Or, you know, it's like the noise says, oh, well, why are you even trying that? It didn't work, uh, you know? And it's always interesting because it's like, you, you'll you hear people say, well, my friend says this. And I'm like, but does your friend know this area? And oftentimes nine out of 10, they're like, actually, no. Why are you listening to them then? Don't listen to me. Go talk to somebody in that area. They're like, oh, yeah, actually, I should. And then, you know, you're activating that voice to be louder than the noise around. But persistence, I think, is and that's part of what my life is around is 
not forcing people to do things that they don't want to do. But I'm always trying to be that that encouraging voice to say, you know, that's really important to you. And, you know, you tried this, but it didn't quite work out. Well, let's sit down and try to come up with a different plan that if this is still important to you, how do we work and get you where you need to go? And it just goes back to what you said earlier about that transaction transformation. And I, it always, I, I always say, I don't like the word networking. I like the word um, relationship building. So oftentimes in university or the work environment, we say, oh, you know, we're going to a networking event. And to me, networking seems very transactional. It's like, yeah, I'm just going to go there, meet people, exchange business cards, maybe uh, talk to people or find out who I need to talk to. And, and it's very transactional. Relationship building means I'll meet you at an event and I'll, I'll see you and I'll just come up and you and I will just start engaging in a conversation. And, you know, it starts establishing a foundation. Who knows where it's going to guide us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I like how you put that. Mm -hmm. In your TED Talk, you also brought up the art of war, which I love this book. Yeah, and, and 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 I guess there are actually many art of wars, but there is one art of war that we associate when we say that. And you talked about strategy and warfare, but there's so much strategy and warfare. I mean, warfare. Well, look, sometimes it is a battle <laughs> just to get to work with the traffic. But strategies for life, I feel, are really representative in that. Share one or two strategies that you feel this book really embodies mm -hmm. um, that has lasted mm -hmm. all of this time. Yeah. I mean, I think the most important one for me is where in The Art of War, uh, it said, a gentleman always keeps a sword by his side. And what this meant to me, and I, what I love about the book is, you know, there are experts who will say, well, this is what it means. And then there's people like me who will be like, well, here's what it means to me. And when it was stated, a gentleman always keeps a sword by his side, it meant that's my leadership. Meaning I don't have to be a leader 24 seven, but if I see something that needs to be done, the leadership is my sword. I, I can pull it out. I will do what is required. And then after all of this happens or it, it's completed, the, the sword will go back in its sheath and then I can just step back and I don't have to be this so-called leader or deemed as a leader 24 seven. That's why one of my five is a servant leader. And I, and I am very, I'm very careful when I use the word leadership as well, because to me, that's where servant leadership is reflective of that sword. I don't care who gets the credit. It's not about an ego. I just know what needs to be done. And it's also interesting because with the art of war, there's a lot of leadership concepts. And there are conversations where people come to me saying, you know, I want to be a leader. Uh, and I'm like, okay, why'd you come to me? And they're like, well, you're a leader. I said, okay, what makes me a leader? Because again, I ask a lot of questions. And they use these beautiful words. And I said, well, that's great, but none of those things make me a leader. There's only one thing. So followers. And Leadership is not a place to be or a position. Leadership is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And you don't determine if you are a leader. The people around you determine if you're worthy of that title or not. And you develop that as a rapport with them. So there are people who will see me as a leader, and there are people who don't see me as a leader. But I don't strive for that position. I just know what needs to be done. And that's where I think you know, with the art of war, the whole aspect of that leadership piece comes forward for me. And that's what I pull out of that book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like how you phrase that because, um, you know, for certain points, I've been there myself where I'm like, I need to, I have wanted to do certain things. I have certain degrees to get up. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's more to, um, for some people, it's because they want that title because mm -hmm. I feel like everybody's a supervisor of some sort. But other people, and that's the group I really, I really went through my own ego. It's a different challenge, mm -hmm. right? But in that same token, I had that opportunity where I'm like, uh, wait, what you said, there are leaders that have a title on a badge and they may or may not have any respect of mm -hmm. the people they are leading. Mm -hmm. It only means you have a really nice title. But if you're not a leader in their heart, you're a leader with no group. You're a shepherd with no sheep. 
Yep. What's the benefit of that? There, where's mm-hmm. the legacy in that? And so to, to just have that leadership in someone's heart, you have that whether you work together or whether you don't. Yeah. That's very valuable. No, totally. And and I really appreciate the way you said that because, you know, we spend 95% of our time talking about leadership, whereas 95% of the people may be followers. Yeah. And <laughs> we need to focus on followers and not follower isn't a, a followership isn't blindly following like sheep. Followership is how do I support the leader in the best possible way? This is a group effort and we have to work together on this. So there's different methods of followership. And I'd like to see more focus on followership as opposed to just leadership, maybe a a parallel approach to it. Yeah, yeah, that's Mm -hmm. a really good way of of pointing that out. You are also, like you said, um, you had a really beautiful um, description of who you are, but Mm -hmm. what you do. You're a writer, you're a speaker, you're a blogger. Share a little bit about that. What have you been writing and blogging? Where are you, what, are, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got about 180 blog posts on my site and it's all about reflections on life and career. And I guess for me, it's also how I mentor myself is through my writing. Uh, my first book was on personal storytelling and uh, discovered the extraordinary in the ordinary. And it was a, a book I wrote to help others realize and and share their stories. And then the second book I wrote was about my journey to India to find my ancestral roots with a faded photograph, very little else. And at the same time, realize my own personal identity as a British born Canadian with parents from Fiji and grandfathers from India. Well, who am I? So that book is called Lost and Found, Seeking the Past and Finding Myself. And it was a a beautiful journey that, again, both of those books were never written for status. It was never written about, you know, uh, the title of an author or how much money can I make or can I, you you know, where, where, where can I get this? I need to be a Canadian bestseller author. Actually, it was written both of them, especially the second book, the one about my travels to India is it's a beautiful story that just needs to be shared and helping people realize their own identity. And, um, and who knows? I mean, with that uh, book about India, I think the next thing I'd like to pursue on that is to make it into a screenplay. I think it's got the legs to make it into a screenplay, but the only condition on the screenplay is I want to have a cameo in the background. (laughs) As you should. (laughs) Just be the- Fiji and India. Yeah, yeah, all of those places. Be the chai wale who's got a stall serving tea to people and you know, I'll be in the background and just don't look at the camera. (laughs) I like that. How can, so you also uh, offer mentoring, coaching, how um, would someone be able to to learn more about you and, and get in touch with you and help grow in their own persistence, reduce their limitations and have a vision for their future? Yeah, I mean, definitely tap into my website. I mean, it's uh, www.sam-thiara.com. And like I said, there's about 180 blog posts. Uh, That's also where the book is. And that's also where, you know, I can be found for speaking or coaching. But I'm also on LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter. So all of those places, uh, you can find me or you can read about different articles or things that I've been writing there. But by all means, uh, easy to find me. Awesome. Awesome. Now, the last question. Mm -hmm. You have done a lot. My podcast is called In the Rising. Mm-hmm. Where do you see yourself still rising up to? What is on the horizon or on the mountaintop still for you yet? That's a very good deep question because the things that I'm doing really now are very authentic to who I am as an individual. Those will carry on. The screenplay, I think, is something that I would really like to vision and to do because again, it's a it's a beautiful story that needs to be shared and it's a different mechanism. So I think the the screenplay, but equally something I've embraced is my outlet. And I encourage everybody to have an outlet. Uh, My outlet is woodworking and making furniture and things. And people are like, oh, you should leave your teaching position and whatnot and go into this because the outlet, what I found is by doing the woodworking, I can spend three, four hours in my wood shop, in my garage, and not even know where the time has gone. And, you know, what I do is I create things and 
it's the richness of the work that I get to do. So that's something that I would love to do. But what I'm presently doing, I still see myself doing in the future as well. But uh, the screenplay and maybe more woodworking are two things that are on my horizon. What true words, you know, I, I think the lesson that came to me was if right now you had to read about my story, where would you say, Bettina, it was right in front of you. The door was open, the door stopper. You had many door stoppers to keep that door open. Why didn't you go? I like that idea. And so I encourage you to share this uh, podcast with anyone you feel it would benefit. You know, it's important to put this in the hands and ears of those that it will make a greater impact for. If you like this podcast, I encourage you to leave a five-star review. It does so much to help spread the word about it. And until next time, let's keep building one another up.